everybody. Welcome. Can you believe we are at our last meeting? In a way, it seems like we started months and months ago. In a way, it feels like yesterday. But this has been a wonderful journey, and it has been so great to be on it with all of you. So my name is Carla Myers. I'm the coordinator of scholarly communications for Miami University in Ohio, not Florida. Um, I'm going to be your host and facilitator today. Soon I'm gonna be handing things off to Kevin Hawkins, who's the Assistant Dean of Scholarly Communications for the University of North Texas Libraries. First though, we have a few housekeeping things to take care of. Um, this webinar is being recorded. It will be added to the YouTube Pub 101 Spring 22 playlist. So if you do have to pop out for a moment, you can go back and catch up on what has been uh, discussed. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for everybody aligned with our community norms, which I will share the chat to that in, I will share the link to the community norms in the chat in a second. Please join us in creating a safe and constructed space and review those norms when you get a chance. Um, so before we get started, we are going to do kind of a little wrap up from uh, us, your leaders, um, Amanda, uh, Karen, and I. Um, so, you know, welcome to the end. We made it. We hope you have all learned as much as we have from our presenters as we've gone along. Karen, if we can go to the next slide, please. So today, um, before we bring Kevin on to speak, we're going to reflect a little bit on where we got started. We're going to discuss options for continued to support, for continued support. We want your feedback, and we are going to share a link where you can provide that to us. And then uh, we will bring on Kevin Hawkins to talk about printing, sharing, and selling open textbooks. So I'm going to hand things off to Amanda. Hi, everybody. Um, it's me again, Amanda Larson, the Affordable Learning Instruction Consultant at The Ohio State University and co-chair of the Pub 101 Committee. And I think what we're going to talk about right now is just the scene that we have established so far in Pub 101. So we have talked about how publishing is integral to open education. Um, it allows for more voices and perspectives to be a part of a textbook and a classroom. It allows folks to localize and indigenize textbooks to reflect their um, local context. And it also allows folks to update text to reflect the moment. So in a lot of disciplines, there are case studies and stories and interview and multimedia and data that change pretty rapidly. And OER give them an opportunity to add those things as they come out. Um, and also it provides an opportunity and space where students can actually be authors of their own content and create content that contributes to the scholarly conversation in that class. Go ahead to the next slide. We've also learned that publishing can mean many things. So it could mean that there's an author who is creating and writing and making from scratch some sort of textbook or learning resource. It also can mean that they are adapting, editing, modifying, remixing, um, and also that it could be a kind of post or archive of information and that it also provides space for open pedagogy, which is again, students helping to create the text. And um, it can also be a solo or collaborative process and support what you folks might be interested in providing um, can take many different forms. It can take time and expertise, but it also might be picking and choosing from a programmatic buffet. So I only wanna support this thing and this thing, and then you might need external support for the next thing. Next slide, please. So, Pub 101 Memories. So this was your orientation to publishing. Um, and we suggest that it's best to prioritize accessibility and inclusion from the start of your program, um, that you should build your program by defining and communicating parameters. So thinking about what you can and can't support, anticipate what you can and accept that there will be surprises along the way. I don't think I've ever not been surprised by something that's cropped up and that you can work with authors strategically and openly. Next slide, please. So what we would like to do is just take a few minutes and chat and have you share what you'll remember from the Pub 101 sessions that you have participated in so far.
Cheryl says the MOU advice was really helpful. Carla says that I'm not alone when it comes to doing this work. Karen's gonna remember how chatty y'all were. Ooh, these are coming in fast now. Tools, example program calls, proposal, award agreements, and just the supports available. The session on accessibility in DEI were extremely helpful and applicable to the strategic plan. I appreciate the ideas that the ideas are flexible, i.e. the buffet. We don't have to do it all, especially with no budget. The importance of clear expectations and descriptions of what the author and we will do. So relieved to find out that all the resources, all the resources that are available has increased my confidence that we can do this. I love to hear that. I will remember the advice to set parameters with authors before starting projects, i.e. MOUs. I appreciate the call for proposal examples and how it changed over the years. I like that this is an OER movement and not just a project. Those are all really fantastic and just like make my heart so happy that those are the takeaways that you had from this, um, from Pub 101 so far. So we, I just wanna remind you that you're not alone. Uh, the community is here to help. You have this wonderful community of people who you have gone through Pub 101 with. You have me and Karen and Carla and all of the presenters who are part of that community as well. And if we don't know the answer, we can probably connect you to somebody who might know the answer. I know I'm always happy to help brainstorm things um, or talk through things. So please don't hesitate to use the community that you've built here. Um, resources abound. Please make sure that you uh, check out all of the resources that are in your class notes that the presenters have shared. Um, and remember that the templates that have been shared can be modified so you don't have to start from scratch. And then most importantly is that this work can be very isolating and lonely, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, again, take advantage of the community and remember that taking care of yourself is an important aspect of doing this work. You can't serve people if the well is empty. And it's really important to set yourself up for success by building in that self-care from the beginning, by making sure that you're setting clear expectations with your authors and make sure that you take time for reflection to figure out what is and what isn't working and how the work that you're doing could serve you better. So at that note, I am happy to turn this over to Karen. Thank you, Amanda, and thank you, Carla, and thank you everyone who has joined us on the 2022 Spring Pub 101 journey. I would love to stay on that path with all of you. As Amanda was just talking about, there's an incredible community of people to support you in the work you're doing. And the OEN uh, also offers ongoing support. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about ongoing support and some options that are available. Um, as you know, throughout our Pub 101 uh, eight sessions together, we were in uh, what we like to call a one-stop doc or our orientation syllabus, if you will. All of the um, slides should be linked from that syllabus. I'll take a look after today's session to make sure that's the case. So if you wanna revisit anything, you can go back to that document. We also had class notes, which are linked from the orientation document. There were some additional resources that were shared, particularly in the earlier Pub 101 sessions. So you can always go back to that. And then for the first time ever this year, we started sharing the transcripts and chat transcripts and video links on our blog. So if you ever want to look at things holistically, um, you can go to our blog, which is, uh, is listed there. In addition, if you are the OEN contact for your institution, you have access to a dashboard that looks something like this. It's called the Community Hub. So if you are the person with that access, you can also find a lot of the templates and resources that we talked about in Pub 101 under the Publishing Support tab. If you uh, do not have access to the Community Hub, you can also find almost all of these same resources in the Canvas curriculum that we've been using uh, every step of the way during Pub 101. You are also welcome to join the Publishing Cooperative. This is for institutional, allied, or consortial OEN members. And what is the co-op? Really simply, it's a community of people who are publishing or who are interested in publishing open textbooks. 
Together, we're growing open textbook publishing expertise and capacity in higher education by figuring out how to do this thing, sometimes through trial and error, often by learning from one another. And so the co-op is really um, a community of people to support one another in that process. Here at a glance are some of the institutions that are represented by people in the co-op. And um, it really is grounded in community and support. And I know that some of the Pub 101 um, participants who are here today also participate in the, in the co-op already. Um, and so there's a lot of um, great overlap and it's a really nice opportunity to get to know people um, in your community. Also part of the co-op, we have a monthly tea time session, very informal, it's unstructured, it's a drop-in time for all of you to really drive the agenda. And so um, people come, ask questions, troubleshoot and support one another. We also have a Google group uh, for the publishing co-op. And so um, if you were to join, I would be happy to add you to that. And here is a uh, just sort of a recap, a table of some of the publishing support that is offered through the Open Education Network. I have color coded this uh, just to sort of uh, show you at a glance some of the different areas that we are working to support you. So that includes through professional development, opportunities like these, through community and support like the co-op, which we just talked about, and also through tools and resources. And we've been um, investing a lot of our focus and energy in this tools and resources section lately um, because there are more coming soon. You may have heard we just launched a manifold pilot. There are some people in this Pub 101 group who are participating in that pilot. Again, really awesome to have that overlap. We are also going to be looking at um, providing Editoria, which is um, another publishing platform tool. And soon at Summit in July, you will hear about the Textbook Builder, which is a tool we've been working on with the Editoria team through an IMLS funded grant to provide authors with the opportunity to structure their textbooks before they start writing and to give them some uh, structure and support in, in making consistent, uh, consistent books. Okay, so that is the OEN community support at a glance. Now uh, let's take just three to five minutes for a survey. Carla, Amanda, and I, and the whole Pub 101 committee would really like to hear your feedback. As we mentioned in the beginning of, uh, of these eight weeks together, this is the first time that we have um, provided Pub 101 in this more sort of committee informed way. Um, we just got started with the committee recently. We just took sort of our first look at the curriculum. And this summer, we're gonna be doing a lot more revisions. And so please uh, help us, let us know what worked and didn't work for you and provide feedback both on this live experience and also on the um, curriculum experience. So Amanda just dropped the link to the survey form into chat. I will set my timer and um, go ahead and give you three to five minutes. After you have completed the survey, if you just wanna, um, uh oh, Beth says it's not loading for her. We will look into that, Beth. Thanks for letting us know. Anyone else having trouble? Slowly. Maybe it's because I selected a really cute header image. <laughs> Worked for, okay. It might be um, based on your connection. Okay, great, Beth, Beth is in. Okay, well, as all of you get started, I will stop talking so that you can focus. Um, Thanks, Beth, for letting us know it might be your browser. So if you're having any trouble, please try another browser. Um, once you've had a chance to do the survey, please just let us know in the chat and that'll give us a little, a little clue to resume talking. But for now, I will pause and give you a few minutes. Thank you. So I want to go ahead and turn things over to our presenter today. 
So Kevin Hawkins is Assistant Dean of Scholarly Communications for the University of North Texas Libraries. I am so excited to welcome him to talk with us today about printing, sharing, and selling open textbooks. Um, if you have questions, please share those in the chat. I will keep an eye on those and track those to share with Kevin at the conclusion of his presentation. Great, thanks, Carla. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. I'm Kevin Hawkins from the University of North Texas Libraries. So I was asked to speak to you today about um, your options for um, selling, uh, distributing print versions of open textbooks and other OER, right? So as you know, OER is always freely available online to access. So if you have an internet connection and can reach a website, then you of course can get to the OER online. But, uh, and, and many times the OER is available for you to, um, to download, right? So maybe PDF or ebook format or something, so you could download it and use it often. But some users would like a print version of that work because they prefer reading in print. They would like to easily annotate. Maybe they have some connectivity issues or don't have the right devices for other formats and things like that. And so it's something that you may want to be able to offer as part of your open textbook programs. So I want to talk through a little bit about this world and how it works. I mean, you know, in brief, there's some good news here. Um, you know, printing is much more accessible than it used to be. We've had a lot of advances in the technology. Um, uh, we are far past the world of printing things with printing presses uh, in a traditional uh, model here, which really only ever worked at scale. So we can do a lot of digital printing these days uh, at much smaller scales, right? In kind of um, sort of niche situations here. And um, uh, it allows you to print in very small quantities, um, or sometimes even one copy at a time. And we'll talk a little bit about how this world works. So first, though, I do want to go over a few terms. And I don't want to get you know too far into the world of jargon here and the world of printing industry works. But we do need to have a little bit of understanding of a few things. Um, so I'm going to try to, to give a high-level picture of this. So in the conventional world of printing and distribution, um, you uh, have print runs, right? So when you're going to print uh, a book, you print a certain number of hundreds of thousands of copies at a time, and, and those are all you know, identical. And that is a print run. So when something is first published, you have an initial print run, and then later you reprint as needed based on how many copies you sell. So you, you print in these kind of increments um, um, and, and then sell them. As I hit that earlier, um, we, we, um, there are some options that don't involve them. So we'll talk about that. But in this conventional world, you, you print a bunch of copies. And um, you need distributors uh, who, who store those in a warehouse <laughs> and uh, receive orders and ship them out. Um, and they are in turn, they may be shipping directly to customers, but they often are shipping to um, wholesalers and regular bookstores that are in turn selling. In general, the traditional model is to sell on consignment. Um, so uh, at a discount from the retail price, right? So um, the bookstores are acquiring copies, a whole set of copies that they are going to put on the shelf or maybe set up a little display in the center of the bookstore, like the big, big movies. Um, and you know, they acquire them all at a discount. That's how they've been making the copies. Um, but there's always this option to return their old unsold inventory. So if they don't sell the copies, it's okay. They can get their money back. So they would ship those copies back to the distributor. Or in certain cases, especially with paperback books, sometimes they would actually instead tear off the covers, ship just the covers back, uh, but otherwise uh, pulp the books. That's not what the shipping makes sense. So this is this conventional model. Now, in this new world of digital printing, um, that broadly speaking includes two subcategories. Short run printing, printing in very small quantities at a time, and, and print on demand. Um, in this kind of world, you can replenish your inventory in small increments, right? So it allows you to publish niche titles that aren't gonna uh, sell many copies um, because it's, uh, it's affordable to do that, right? You're not having to commit to publishing to printing hundreds of thousands of copies at a time. 
which costs it. So this is really facilitating this long tail of publishing. And this technology for digital printing, you know, is available in the supply chain. Um, and so publishing houses, publishers, uh, and, and OER publishing operations, you know, can get access to these things um, in the world of, of book publishing. Uh, and some of these services are available for um, direct to consumer services, right? So some of you may have like bought a photo book from Lulu and you know that, um, or made one yourself. And so you know that you can like set it up directly through a website, um, set up the book, and then you can even, you know, purchase copies right through there or, or send them to your friends and family to purchase their own copies, right? So all of this has become much more accessible than I've ever used. So that's a quick background on this. And then I also, another sort of caveat before I really get to the meat here, so please bear with me, is I want to talk a little bit about versions of open books because versioning and all of this is important, right? So in the world of OER, we often, we often use tools like Pressbooks that uh, allow you to, um, you know, make the work available online and provide an interface where you can, you know, instantly edit the work, right? Where you can, you can improve it. Um, make changes right online and it's instantly available to, to users. So even though we have tools that let you update a book instantly and maybe even, you know, regenerate the, the like say, PDF version of that book, there really aren't workflows where a reader could order a print version of that, of that book um, on demand from the latest version from the website, right? So of course they can download the PDF and print it on a home printer, um, but there isn't a way to like get that PDF directly into the, 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 the major printing services, digital printing services. Uh, so that when someone buys a book, that printing service goes out to the press book site and downloads the very latest version, right? So that's something that kind of isn't possible in the world. But, you know, I, I don't think that's such a bad thing because I actually think it's kind of confusing um, for readers of a book if, if, if there's this continual updating and, and that the product they buy uh, is a snapshot at any point and it's not really clear which version this is, right? I mean, in general, it's kind of bad practice to update uh, uh, an open textbook uh, mid-semester anyway um, because your students and others out there who may be using it, um, the sand shifts under their feet. And so it's good to kind of save your updates and do them, you know, um, kind of between semesters, right? At the time of your life, probably January or August or something. Um, and so similarly, it's good if your print versions are also tied to clear versions, right? So, um, because you know, readers can expect that all copies of an edition will be identical. So, um, but you know, if you are going to make some more significant changes to your online book, which then in turn affects the book, you would, in general, and this is kind of the way it works in publishing, you would create a new edition of the book, right? You would clearly label that on the title page, second edition, third edition, whatever. Right? Um, you would assign a new ISBN number because it's the new discrete product, right? People who order it want to know which version they're getting. And if they're going to order by ISBN, then they, they should know which one they're getting. Um, and, you know, you may want to stop selling the old edition at that point. It's outdated and people might not want to get that excellent. On the other hand, maybe you do want to keep supporting that for certain reasons. Um, to allow a disruptor to continue using an urban image. Okay. Let's really get now into this, the things you would be considering here if you decide that you want to, to, to support the selling and distribution of print version of open textbooks. To me, the first question you want to ask is whether you're going to be selling these print copies of books at cost where you're aiming to generate revenue. Please. If you're selling at cost, and here by at cost, I mean the author and the institution aren't making any money. Of course, your printer and distributor need to make money, so they're going to take their cut. But I mean, no one else is going to make money. You're otherwise going to sell at the cost that it costs you to set up this one. So if you do that, there are no income tax implications for the authors or the institution. So it's just a lot easier in terms of official accounting. And there's also no ethical implications here about 
profiting from selling copies to students, right? So if an instructor writes their own OER and puts their students use it, then offers a conversion for sale, and they're going to get a little bit of revenue from the print sales, we're getting into some slightly shitty terms. So it's kind of nice and clean. You plan to sell things at cost. But if you do want to generate revenue because you're trying to recover some of the costs of operating your publishing program, um, you know, you need to think about whether um, this revenue is going to go to the author or to the institution or split between the two, right? Or maybe flow through the institution to the author. Maybe the institution is involved in setting up uh, the print versions, but then they're going to be in turn giving revenue to the author. But you might need to step back from that question and say, you know, if this OER was developed with institutional resources, perhaps an internal grant funding program using special resources, the author may not actually even have any right to it, right? The copyright may belong to the institution anyway, according to institutional policy. And so technically, um, um, it's, it's up to the institution to decide uh, whether to, to share that revenue. And, and it may not even be your decision personally, it may be the decision of another office on campus. There are, of course, those accounting and tax implications. Uh, and so, you know, if this is coming to the institution and the institution is receiving revenue, um, there's usually quite a number of things that would need to be handled uh, for that to happen. Institutions have ways of doing this. It is possible, for example, for US based not for profit organizations and universities to receive uh, it, uh, some income, but they have to account for it in very specific ways. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, you know, there's kind of ethical and policy issues about instructors assigning their own books to their own students and then, you know, having them buy copies, potentially profit. The next question would be whether you would do print runs of the books, even small short runs, so small digital print runs, you know, a couple dozen copies of something but whether you're going to do pure print on demand, where there are no copies printed in advance, and instead they're only copied when someone orders, and they're only printed when someone orders a copy, right? One order comes in, one copy is printed and shipped. All right, so if you do a print run, this requires an, uh, an upfront investment. Someone has to be willing to pay for that, that print run, right? That 50, 100, 200 copies. Um, but, you know, you print a whole bunch of copies at once, and so your unit cost is lower, right? Each copy costs less to print, so again, you're, you're putting a lot of money up. And you need to store those copies until you sell them, right? Uh, as I mentioned before, there are, you know, options for distribution and fulfillment in the book supply chain, and so you could make an arrangement with one of these. Or this is a much smaller scale op uh, operation. If you're basically looking to just make print copies available to the students at your own institution, you, know, you could try to run this locally, right? You could have a closet where you store these copies and, and you know, students walk in and, and, and hand a check to someone and, you know, they get handed a copy. But all of that needs to be accounted for and institutions, um, you know, tend to have lots of rules about things like receiving payment, um, whether by check or credit card or whatever, accounting for inventory. Um, and, you know, if you're looking to make this available for anyone to buy online, uh, again, you're going to probably need a sort of professional distribution option that can, uh, can handle these orders, take credit card payments, potentially handle shipping, um, uh, wherever this is going to go, right? Um, so professional, you know, distributors in the book industry do all of these things and they, and they, and they charge you to store copies, right? So this is a disincentive for you to print too many copies up front and eat up their, their warehouse space. <clears throat> on the other hand, with print on demand, there's no upfront investment, um, right? You, you are just setting it up, but then um, there's no cost to you, you know, at all here uh, until the book is ordered. And even in that case, you're receiving money from a customer. Um, the pod printers, you know, handle the order fulfillment for you. Um, so um, that's great. You can just use one of these and, and they can handle the credit card orders. But um, the problem, one problem with print on demand is that bookstores tend not to stock copies of print on demand books, right? Because they can't return the unsold inventory um, through the consignment model. So why does this matter, right? You weren't, you, you know, these OER are unlikely to be, um, you know, bestsellers. They're not going to have a whole display in a conventional bookstore. But it may matter because, um, you know, um, most uh, campuses and other institutions have some sort of campus bookstore, right, for textbooks. And 
um, students are used to going there and won't be able to buy their books from there. And so you, now you've got to make sure that that bookstore can in fact get copies of this book. Maybe they won't stock it. Maybe they will simply order copies when a student walks in and says, yes, I want that copy. And the bookstore will say, we will order it for you, but it's not refundable. Um, so, you know, as soon as you buy it, um, that's it. Um, or you have to prepay. Um, maybe that's okay, um, but we need to make that arrangement. And this can be especially important because um, sometimes financial aid and scholarships are tied to using the campus bookstore, right? The students can only spend the money, the textbook money at the campus bookstore. So they're not going to want to go off to some other place, some other print-on-demand service to buy a copy. And you may actually have a policy at your institution um, that basically says university employees can only refer students to the campus bookstore, right? They're not allowed to send them to the competing one down the street or to Amazon or anywhere else, right? Students can do that, but by policy, you employees may, may not be able to, may not be allowed to um, refer students. Color printing is also a tricky issue in all of this, okay? So um, um, color, covers are always in cover, uh, in color. So that's not an issue, but it's the interior of the book, okay? So if you print the interior in grayscale, it's much cheaper to print. It works very well with print from the name. But if you have a, a textbook with color diagrams, then, you know, you may, where the color is essential, then you may need to be able to print the interior in color, okay? This is more expensive. And in the world of print-on-demand printing, you basically, in most cases, you have to choose whether to print the whole interior in grayscale or color. You can't say just print pages 33 and 69 in, in color. And so it makes the whole book much more expensive to produce. And so it makes print-on-demand less economically feasible. Right, you have to sell it at a higher price. And, uh, you know, uh, a bar chart with some colors, that's easy. You can do it on basically on standard paper. But if, you, if you've got uh, photographs and you need photo quality paper, the kind of glossy sort of thing or thicker paper, because um, you have reproductions of art or whatever, uh, that's even more expensive and really hard to do it. I mentioned before that your covers are always in color, so you could have regular kind of paperback binding, no problem. Full color cover is just always included in the base prints. If you really wanted to sell in hardcover, that's going to be more expensive, whether you're doing print on demand or not. If you do case binding, that's like a, it's common for textbooks actually. It's the kind of book where, where there's like images printed right on the hardcover. Like a design or cloth binding, right? The sort of traditional thing used with scholarly monographs that has like a dust jacket. In it. That's all much more expensive than paper. From experience, I can tell you, you can't print less than 500 copies at a time with a color interior and do hardcover binding and sell it for a reasonable price, right? You're gonna, you would have to sell it individual copies uh, at such a high price to recover your investment that it will look crazy and to anyone buy, right? It'll be like, they'll say like, but I can get an equivalent book, uh, you know, with a similar number of pages and in color, you know, I'm used to being able to buy such things for $25 or whatever. Well, yes, because the printer, the, the publisher printed 10,000 copies. You need to think about where your customers are. I alluded to this a little bit before. There are lots of options if you are going to just, you know, distribute them locally, um, or even just to customers within your own country, right? Lots of lots of printers will be able to ship within your own country. Shipping abroad gets much more complicated. If you are trying to support, if, if it's important to you to be able to support readers abroad, lots of extra complications here, right? Distributors in general will only ship overseas with traceable shipping, where they can track what happens to it. And that's much more expensive. And so that that, that fee to ship is, is an extra cost that, that the customer ultimately would need to absorb. Um, you know, some print-on-demand printers, the largest ones have locations in multiple places, um, but still, um, if you're trying to ship the developing country, you can get really tricky. So I mean, Amazon will ship to many places, um, even to some developing countries, and, and they do it cheaply because they send it like sort of ordinary or partial service. And if a copy gets lost, they just, eat the cost and, and, and ship another one. But um, distributors are rarely willing to take quite that risk. They're just not big. So there's something to think about. You know, if you were trying to support online students um, who are in many countries taking courses at your institution, uh, it may not be feasible for them to buy a print copy. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, 
if, if you were if you were doing this to try to support your own students um, and, and assume that they could all do this, it might not be feasible. Um, you know, I will say that if any of you are developing open textbooks that are that where you really the print version is designed less for your own students at your own institution and more for users in a particular region of the world with poor connectivity, right? You see this as an alternative for them. Um, because it's about a topic that relates to that country or the region, um, you know, you might try to have the book printed there um, rather than shipping it from here. It's almost certainly going to be cheaper to print and um, not involve high shipping costs and, um, and may give you more options in terms of shipping through a postal service. But in all of this, because it's probably sounding a bit intimidating, I would strongly urge you to look into any distribution options that have a connection to your institution. There may be some options here that will save you from establishing all of these relationships. Your campus bookstore may in fact have a relationship with a, a printing service, even something like print on demand. And of course can distribute because they're, they're used to accepting orders. Um, you know, uh, these bookstores, um, um, you know, are often part of larger chains and they have access to some of these things and they may be used to running things like essentially course pack services, right? And produce essentially custom works and sell them to students. So they may be well set up to handle this for you. And you may have access to a university press, right? Your campus may not have one, but perhaps you are say at um, a public institution in North Carolina or Kansas or just two states that come to mind that have a press that serves the whole public university system in the state. Um, you, the press may be able to help you out with all of this, right? They have these established relationships with printers and, um, and, and distributors and may be able to uh, handle all this for you. I mean, they're not gonna do it for free because it's gonna eat up some of their staff time and, and they're trying to um, you know, um, uh, recover costs, but um, it, it may be a mutually beneficial relationship. And these two entities that come to mind, bookstores and presses, may be willing to work directly with your authors, right? If your authors are in fact going to keep all revenue from sales, if that's the arrangement that you would make, if it's allowable about the policy, that's what you want to do, then you could let them work directly with these parties and, and, and you running up an OER service don't need to be in the middle. You know, basically, if the author owns the copyright and is going to receive all revenue, let them set this up directly. It could have been with that campus bookstore, it could be with a press, but it could also be directly with a print on demand service, right? They can go to Lulu, they can go to Ingram Spark, Kindle Direct Publishing, many other options out there, and, and, and just take the final PDF of the interior PDF of the cover that meets that printer specifications uh, and set it up. And, and and give the tax information so that they get to receive the royalty checks when they're just out of the picture. It's going to be easier all around. So that's what I've got. Um, we have lots of time here for questions. I see there's a number of things in the chat, but I will let our moderators kind of be questions to me. As, as they say. Thank you so much for all that fantastic information, Kevin. Um, so many different things to think about. And uh, I think everybody really loved your quote on trusting you about printing books. So we do have some questions. Um, let me go to my list. The first is, I was at a conference where a librarian was reporting that she had to avoid adopting any OERs that, might ha that had any kind of non-commercial CC license because she knew she had to have the campus bookstore print copies. She was under the impression that printing at cost was prohibited by non-commercial licenses. Is that true? Um, I don't believe so under U.S. copyright law. Um, so what I do know is that there was a court case about um, uh, an educational institution working with um, Carly, you will know this as well. Was it Kinko's or a similar um, um, service for printing? I think it was Kinko's, right? It, yeah. And um, to print the copies to make available for use in a course pack, essentially to make them available for use in the classroom. Uh, and even though Kinko's is a commercial operation, uh, the ultimate use of the work was non-commercial. And so that was um, ruled to be uh, allowed under the CC non-commercial license. Um, 
this situation was slightly different. Um, so sorry, can you re reframe it for me one more time? It was- Sure. Um, so she knew, um, she was under the impression that printing at cost was prohibited yep. by non-commercial licenses. Is that true? Right, right. Um, so um, I, you know, I don't, I don't think so. Um, that's essentially what happened in this case. Um, the the instructor and the institution were not um, were not were not profiting, right? They went to Kinkos and said, "Please print us, you know, twenty copies or whatever for our students. Um, charge what you charge, um, but then otherwise um, we're good." So I think you're okay with that, but you know, I'm not an attorney and I'm not your attorney in any case. So um, so it would certainly be worth. Um, um, having one uh, verify this or talking to your institution's uh, counsel. Great, thank you so much. Um, so the next question is, only a campus store could handle billing students directly, which, would be which could be dealt with by loans, correct? So there is perhaps an incentive to as campus stores do POD. Ours has already said they don't have the capacity to do print on demand in house. Okay. Well, right. So that was one of my suggestions. It was, of course, talking to yes at the campus bookstore. So sorry to hear that they they don't. Um, the, the, yeah, they don't have the capacity to do that. that but, um, hopefully, some of the others will have better luck. And I will just say from experience, talk to your bursar's office. I know at one of my previous institutions, we were able to send bills from our library for like overdue books, lost book charges, things like that to the bursar's office that students could have paid off with loans. Um, you know, it wasn't automated. We had to like go into their system, generate the bill and then hit submit. And then the student paid it with their loans. It wouldn't come directly from the POD machine to that. Um, but that might be worth checking out, like talk to your bursar's office. They might have options for you. Um, I think that's most of our questions that we have so far. Yeah, sorry, I'm so sorry. That's my little blind kitten. <laughs> he just woke up from his nap and wants his bottle and let me see if holding him makes him feel a little better. I'm sorry, like super unprofessional. This is baby Sam. <laughs> um, so please share your questions as you have them. Kevin, I have a question for you, um, and you kind of touched on all of this in your presentation, but I would say, you know, we are thinking about offering some type of printing program at Miami University. So what would be like your number one piece of advice to any institution who's thinking about offering some type of option to sell print copies? Like, is it best to make the decision based off the resources your institution has or space or staffing? Like, what are key consider? What's, what's the number one piece of advice you'd give? Right. Well, so, so you know, if, if, if by policy you've decided that authors get to keep the copyright, right, then we're, we're back here. Um, uh, or, sorry, am I still sharing my slides? Um, oh, okay. Well, it's the one that um, if the, here, let me just pull it up. Um, right, if the author of the copyright will receive all revenue, then let them work directly, right? Don't get in the middle. Um, but uh, for all the reasons I explained earlier in my presentation, that may well not be the case. And so, um, um, you know, if, if you're gonna be um, setting something up, um, you know, I, would, I think you're gonna wanna, um, you know, explore what options you may have. Um, you know, a service like um, Lulu that serves the general public, um, the consumers who just come to their website, um, you know, may work fine. And you may be able to put that through your university procurement process and um, 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 use them for your handful of books that you'll, that you'll sell, or at least where you start. You know, the, the ones in the, in the publishing supply chain that work with um, publishers um, are, are in general going to be, um, they may not be jumping um, to, to work with a startup operation because they're used to working with um, publishers, larger um, organizations that put through a higher volume of content, right? And um, you may never have enough sales to make it worth it. I mean, I actually worked with a, a for a while with a, a smaller um, a printer and distributor, a 
that it's one on the smaller end. They work with some university presses and things, but I had set up a couple of books with them to be essentially print on demand, and they eventually cut me off because I just like wasn't selling enough copies to make it just worth their time for me to be in their system, right? So I get it, you know. Um, so so you may end up having to go with one of these consumer-facing services again, Ingram Spark, um, Kindle Direct Publishing, and Amazon's. Um, uh, are two appealing options. And Ingram is, is totally plugged into the book supply chain. Um, and the Amazon option gives you the option to think, have your books included in the Amazon catalog, which for many people is essentially the requirement. Great, thank you so much. That makes a ton of sense. Um, so I'm, I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> um, so uh, we invite everybody to uh, post any last minute questions you might have. If I missed your question in the chat, please repost it, bring it to my attention. Um, I think I caught them all. Otherwise, well, we might be waiting for uh, the last question or two to come in. Uh, Kevin, do you have any closing thoughts or recommendations for everybody? Um. No, yeah, um, right. Uh, Cheryl mentioned print me one as well. I've also heard that um, uh, them recommended. A um, number of people have mentioned them working with them for OER. Um, so yeah, I have not worked with them directly, but it is a promising option and much smaller than the other one. But um, no, no other particular particular suggestions for you. Um, I mean, basically, <laughs> take a moment to think, is it really worth all, all the trouble that I described to do print? versions, right? Or can your users simply download a PDF and, and print it on a printer somewhere? Um, you know, it, it may just really be your, your simple option. Right? Great recommendations. Thank you so much, Kevin, for your wonderful presentation. Um, you know, one thing I, I think I've really been reflecting on over, you know, our past presentations is how much unique knowledge everybody brings to the cohort, brings to this process. Um, I obviously know nothing about this, even though this is something my institution is interested in doing. And kind of like Amanda said earlier, you know, if, if somebody doesn't have an answer for you when you reach out with questions, I think one of my favorite things about the OEN is chances are they know somebody who has that knowledge and can connect you. Um, Amanda and Karen, I'd like to invite you to unmute if you have any final thoughts or words for the uh, group before we sign off on our last session. And I'm going to mute so you don't have to hear little Sam screaming. I'm so sorry. Everybody's in love with his screaming, though. <laughs> we ended the best, right, with kitten screamings and, and kitten content. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you all for joining us on this journey during the spring semester. It's been really great having you all here together in a cohort to learn together. And um, I mean it when I say that you can reach out to me, like that's not me being like nice. Like if you have questions and I can help, I would love to be helpful. I'm gonna turn it over to Karen now. Last thoughts? No, uh, well, um, I will just uh, thank Carla, Amanda, and the entire Pub 101 committee for their time and attention and dedication to the Pub 101 experience. We do truly want to make this meaningful and useful to all of you. So thank you in advance for your feedback. And I look forward to our paths crossing again in the future. So thank you very much and farewell. Thanks, everybody. Take care.